But what actually jumped out to me was I saw an article that said that there were only three black Fortune 500 CEOs. I was like, oh, interesting. So I went and looked at their names. Marvin Ellison, Kenneth Frazier, and Roger Ferguson. And as a bonus, the wealthiest black man in America is named Robert Smith. So I, I looked and I go, oh, three very ethnic free names, if you will. Yeah, Bob Smith. A exactly. Yeah. So I, I said to myself, okay, I'm not a Fortune 500 CEO, but I've, I've made it to the CEO chair and we, we've won a few awards and we've, we've done a few things. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to reclaim my name and I'm going to start going by Javon. Because what I had to admit and acknowledge was I was part of the problem. I edited myself to fit in to corporate America. And the reason why I reclaim my name is I wanted every Ravante, Martavius, Laquanda, Lucretia to be able to see a Javon in the CEO chair. To, to and, and I did it with the belief that maybe one day you could work with Javon and not just JT. And, and again, I was part of the problem. The fact that I edited myself, the fact that I became JT to fit into the corporate America playbook, that in itself is a problem because the playbook has to be erased and broken somewhere. So for me, it was, okay, I'm going to go by Javon McCormick. I don't want to be a part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution. And I want others who have quote unquote ethnic names to be able to see that, uh, that a Javon sits in the, the CEO chair. You're listening to the Real Business Connections Network. Real Business Connections Network. Powered, powered, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. Subscribe now and check us out at realbusinessconnections.com. Enjoy the show. 15 seconds, guys. Quick disclaimer. <sighs> The internet, the elephant in the room, the internet shat the bed at one point. It wasn't perfect, but this was one of the most incredible interviews of the history of this show, of the history of my career. So you really should bear with me and listen to it all. You will gain so much value, but I just wanted to address that in the front that there is a couple small internet issues. So at one point it cuts out. You're still going to enjoy the heck out of this. You're still going to love it. Here we go with me and Javon. Welcome everyone to Learn, Speak, Teach, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. If you love to learn, be inspired, and succeed, we're here to speak and teach. I'm your host, Ben Albert. I believe if you're not living, you're dying. If you're not growing, you're withering. And if you're not engaged, you can turn this off right now. Because we here at LST are lifelong learners. And listen, I'm not your guru. I'm an ordinary guy on a journey to learn from the experts. My goal is to host each conversation with a beginner's mindset. Learn and let the experts speak and teach their truths. Join us. Oh yeah, and don't forget to subscribe. This episode is brought to you completely free. Get some stake in the game here. My fee for the show only takes a few moments. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend and explain your favorite part. Bonus points. Please leave us a review on Apple, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to the show. All right, let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to Learn, Speak, Teach on the Real Business Connections Network. I am here with Javon McCormick. Javon, what's up, man? How are you today? My man, Big Ben. What's going on, sir? Bro, I'm excited. You came at high regard, high nomination from a good friend of mine, David Mamano. I'm so happy he made that recommendation because, wow, the listeners are going to learn a little bit more in a second. Um, but I want to start with your bio. And this is only a quick taste, guys. Um, Javon McCormick is a CEO, speaker, and author, but his life didn't begin as a success story. He was born uh, the son of a black pimp father and a white single mother on welfare. Poverty, abuse, eviction, and discrimination were a daily part of his life. 
Today, Javon is the CEO of Scribe Media. Where where are you right now? You're in the Scribe Library, right? I'm in the Scribe Library, man. So uh, all of the authors that we have published, we've worked with over and over 2,000 authors now. So it's just a, a, a sample of, of books we've published. So this in the background, anyone watching the video version is a sample. If you're listening to the audio, I recommend you go to the video version and at least take a glimpse of this, this atmosphere, all the books behind Javon today. Um, but Scribe Media, multi-million dollar publishing company, helps entrepreneurs, executives, and experts republish and market their books Today, transparently, Javon explores where he came from, where we are, and where we're going in the world of leadership and business. He believes the future is about people, putting people first in a way that doesn't sacrifice profit, but actually amplifies it. I love it, Javon. The last thing we didn't mention is you are an author of your own memoir, Um, I Got There, How a Mixed Race Kid Overcame Racism poverty, and abuse to arrive at the American dream. To start, Javon, as if I'm not talking too much as it is, very (laughs) short story. I'm out on the the back patio reading your book. Um, My girlfriend walks out. She says, hey, babe, do you want to go for a walk? I look up and there's just like, I look like I had just seen a ghost. And she goes, (laughs) Ben, why do you, (laughs) what's going on? And I'm like, I promise this isn't a bad thing. You just have to read this book. Well, why do you think I looked like a ghost? Let's start from the start, Javon. So your father, you're, you live in Dayton, Ohio. You have over 20 brothers and sisters. L- let's start there. How many brothers and sisters do you oh, have? Oh, man. Yeah, my my dad, He uh, and you, you mentioned it. My, my dad was a, a black pimp back in the 70s. He put women on a street corner. They sold their bodies, and my dad took every dollar. Uh, along the way, he also uh, fathered. 23 children. So there's 23 of us. I'm, I'm one of 23. My, my mother, I'm the only one by my mom. So she only had one. She, she learned her lesson. She shouldn't have had me and, and she left it at that. Uh, but yeah, my, my dad does 23 of us, man. So there's 23. Where, where are you in the mix? Youngest, oldest, middle, middle. I am the, uh, so I'm the third oldest. Uh, of all of so so yeah i've got my uh, an older sister this will put it in perspective for you i have a sister my oldest sister is five years younger than my mom so that that kind of lets you know where you know how much older my dad was you know the spectrum of where you know so so i'm 50 now and i believe the youngest of of all of us is maybe 20 wow so Dayton, Ohio, tw- 23 brothers and sisters, great reach as to, I presume it's all not with the same woman, lots of different women. Oh yeah. The most, the most he, my, my dad had by, by with there were three with, okay. by one woman. So that lets you know he got around. <laughs> and wow. I want people to read the book. I really, really, really high, highly recommend people do. But to kind of give a taste, what what was that life like? So your father was a pimp. He was very wealthy. Your mother was very poor. So you kind of lived both those lives. Um, I don't mind where we start, but let's talk about a little bit about your father and a little bit about your mother and the change in lives and how the, the culture between living in those two environments were different. Um, do you have a preference if we want to start with your mom or dad? No, you know, I, I'll back up a bit. Um, Please do. You know, I, I, I would not call my dad wealthy. What we okay. would say growing where, where I grew up, we call it hood rich. You know, my dad was a, a, a pimp. Um, I, I always make the joke. Some some people have said to me, they're like, oh, my gosh, you're, you're, you're rich. And I said, um, oh, no, they, they, they've said I, I'm wealthy. And they go, no, I'm not wealthy and, and I'm rich. And they go, what, what's the difference? I said, you can spend rich. You can't spend wealth. Wealth is generational. <laughs> you just can't outspend wealth. But right. my dad wasn't, I wouldn't even say he was rich. He was hood rich, uh, meaning, yeah, he had the flashy car. My dad always wore suits. Um, but yeah, he didn't take care of any of us. So, you know, my mom was poor on welfare. 
Uh, I know what it's like to, to pull food out of a trash can and eat from a trash can because there's not going to be anything to eat when you get home. Uh, my mom didn't even learn how to drive until she was 35. So we walked and rode the bus everywhere. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, even those times, my, my dad would pick me up two, three times a month, but you did. I, I got to see a, a different uh, piece of life. I got to ride in a nice car. I got to go to my my dad's house, with the, which was always decked out. Um, but you always came back to reality, which was poverty, poor, struggling, um, trying to make ends meet, food stamps, welfare, standing in line, um, watching people call your mom, um, and, and I don't know if you have to edit this, but call I your mom not. a nigger lover. Yeah, and, and that sucked. You know, being half white, half black in the 70s, not a good look. You know, black people didn't like me because – uh, I, I was half white. White people didn't like me because I was half black. So it, it was tough growing up in the 70s. But I, I say all that uh, wouldn't change it. Uh, my, I know things about life that most people are never going to experience, never know. And it has equipped me for business, it, it equipped me for life. Uh, so, man, if I had to go back and relive my childhood five more times to have the life I have now, man, sign me up. I love this. And I, I remember when I, I don't know if it was on podcasts, I remember hearing you say this. I'm like, this man is such an attitude of gratitude that to, to even have that mindset. I mean, tell me about the life you're able to give your kids and your family today. And, and you think everything you went through is worth it to give them that life? Oh, hell yeah. My, my, <laughs> my kids won't know, um, uh, other than the stories that I tell them, they'll, they'll know nothing about how I grew up. My kids go to private Christian school. Um, the, the teachers tell them they love them each day. Uh, they live in a gated community. I mean, there's a pond in our backyard. You know, there's yeah. there's deer and, and ducks. And, and so uh, I, I always make the joke, you know, I get to see people running for health. Um, when I was a kid, I, I, people ran because they were trying to, they were running away from something and it was usually bullets, but, um, cool. yeah, it's, it's a different, uh, they, they, they just, everything's different. There's food in the pantry. There's food in the refrigerator. My, my, my eight year old, uh, my oldest, I mean, she's been to Disney world three times already. You know, it, I, it took me 46 years to get to Disney world. So, um, yeah, di different lifestyle. And, and I'm happy for that. I'm, I'm very proud of the fact of how they live, what, what they, uh, the, the peace and the joy that they get to have a, a, a home of heat, water, food, comfort. There, there is my, my children get to live. I survived. I was taught how to survive. My children get to live. You got there, Javon. Just like the, the, <laughs> the book says, I got there and you had to survive. I mean, uh, tell us a couple of these stories. I, I, I recall, you know, cutting a toothpaste, cutting toothpaste in half to, to get out the little bits. Oh, man, you really read the book. Um, I'm you, currently, you, I'm not good, kidding. Man. I Like you, I actually am a very slow reader. I almost read in my head. I'll read out loud to myself. And I'm not done with the book yet. I should be. However, I couldn't put it down. Uh, I, I started reading it to prepare for this interview. And again, it at times I wanted to cry. At times I was smiling with joy for you. Um, let's talk about a little bit of some of those extra stories you tell in the book, like the toothpaste one. Man, yeah, my my mom, you know, you, you squeeze the toothpaste and a lot of people, you know, they'll fold it over to get out the, the remainder. Man, my mom would get a pair of scissors and cut that damn thing down the middle and open it up and you took your toothbrush and you scraped the, the remnant, remnants out of, out of the inside. Um we used to joke, my mom would, she would say that we were so poor, we couldn't afford the O and the R. We were just Poe. And, <laughs> and, but yeah, it, it's, but, yeah. but again, man, I, um, I would say this in reference to what you, you mentioned about my children. The hardest lesson that I have found as, as an adult is how do I give my children everything and also teach them how to appreciate it? The, the fact of the matter is the reason why I appreciate all the things that I have is because I didn't have them, you know, in, until you know what it's like 
to ride the bus everywhere. And, and people hear that, but they don't really understand when, when I say ride the bus everywhere, we didn't have a washer and dryer. So that means you had to put all your clothes in black hefty trash bags, go wait at the bus stop, wait for the bus to pick you up, rain or shine, snow, cold, whatever, ride the bus to the, the, the laundromat, wash all your shit, put it back in the bag, wait for the bus, go back home. And, and so when I say ride the bus, we're talking if you need to go to the grocery store and you can only carry so many bags at a time. This isn't like now, you know, we got these big ass SUVs and my wife's got all this stuff in the back where, okay, we get home. Or better yet, let me actually expose my wife a little further. She doesn't load up shit. The groceries get delivered to the house now. Yes. Instacart. <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, I got Whole Foods dropping off shit daily. Um, but, but but again, man, it makes me smile. I'm very happy that that we have that lifestyle, that we're able to provide that lifestyle. Uh, my wife, she's, a, um, she's able to stay at home, raise our children, pick them up from school, take them to activities. And, and I love it. It's the, the life that we both want. And it's Again, man, it comes comes from hard work. But to, to your point, yeah, I got a GED. I never went to college. I got a GED. Um, I read slow as hell. Um, thank God for audiobooks, because uh, man, I can consume a lot through audiobooks. Uh, God bless the man or woman that created spell check, because because I can't spell and can't tell you an adverb from an adjective. But here I am, CEO of a, of a publishing company. So um, yeah, man, it was it was rough, but I. The lessons that came from my childhood have served me well, even from my first lesson of entrepreneurship. It actually came from dad. My, my dad had me one weekend, I was nine years old, and we were out collecting money from prostitutes. And we pull up to the first prostitute and she puts a huge stack of money through the window. And I remember it was cold. Like I can still smell the heater from, from my dad's car. Uh, we were in his, his uh, Cadillac Eldorado Barrett's candy apple red paint on the outside, candy apple red leather seats, and and, and Ben, candy apple red carpet. <laughs> I mean, okay. it was, everything was red. Candy apple everything. So she uh, slides through a big stack of money. And she tells my dad, can I come in now? You know, I made my count, made my money, whatever. And my dad in the most loving way, oh no, girl, get back out there. You're on a roll. You know, uh, I'm going to come back around and pick you up and you can pick where we want to go to dinner. Like, like that was a benefit. Like, oh, positive. You get to pick where we're going to go to dinner. So we drove off and we pull up to the next lady and she slides through what looks like $3 and my dad lost his shit. He called that woman every foul derogatory word you can think of. And at the end, he said, get back out there. And now, Ben, that's very key. Don't be common. My dad would always say that. He'd say it to his kids. He'd say it to the prostitutes. Don't be common. And what he was saying when he would tell the prostitutes this is, when you're out there, don't walk the corner common, don't dress common. And when you're in bed, don't be common. Be common. And that made it made its way to just to me, his son. And so it was always don't be common. And and but that was my first view into entrepreneurship because at that moment I remember saying to myself, okay, if I was a pimp. And I treated the prostitutes better and they got to keep part of the money. Could I have more prostitutes in volume and then make more money hmm. than my dad does doing it his way? And then I even thought about, okay, but what about competition? A lot of pimps are going to be mad because I'm going to take their women because I'm treating them nicer and they're getting to keep part of the money. And I was nine. I was, this was, this was the whole thought process behind entrepreneurship that was my lesson so check check one two one two i think we're back javon dude i i i'm joking with you i pay as much money as i can for this internet there's no one in the house 
the best internet money can buy in my area here and it still shit the bed. So don't know what's going on. I don't know exactly where we clipped out, but I do know um, that you are asserting to not be common, to be uncommon, to be different. And I want to tie in Scribe Media. So as the CEO of Scribe, what are some of the uncommon ways you do things that are different than maybe a traditional publisher? Wow. So in in how we serve our authors, I'll, I'll use probably our arguably our most known author. So we did the book for David Goggins, Can't mm. Hurt Me. And I'll give you the story behind him. So he ended up with a traditional deal. Traditional publishing was going to give him a, a $350,000 advance to do his book. And if you know anything about David Goggins, former Navy SEAL, uh, once held the uh, pull-up record, ultra marathoner, so on and so forth. Well, he said, nope, I want to keep control and I want to own my story and own all the rights to, to my book. Whereas if you go with traditional, there's no other way to say it. They own your ass. And then so they own your story. They own, own everything. And you'll get some crumbs on the royalties on the back end. So David said, nope, I, I'm going to go and, and publish my, myself. And his agent ended up firing him. They're like, you know what? You're stupid. Wow. You're never, you're not, you're going to, you're not going to make shit. Uh, so he published with us. And what's interesting is he was offered a $350,000 advance. The day his book went live and published, he made a half million dollars. And so to, to date, that book has made a ton of, of money. Let's just, it's just we'll, we'll put it this way, over $20 million. Um, wow. So he's, he's done well, but he owns all the rights to his book. He went through us. Um, and that's really the big difference between us. And, and we also help authors uh, write, market, publish their books. Uh, some people, they could never sit down and write a book themselves. So we walk them through and they, they speak their book out loud. We structure it. We make sure it flows correctly. We make, you know, the proofreading, the, uh, the editing, everything it takes to the, the cover design, interior layout, get it published. So we do everything start to finish. And the, what differentiates us is they're self-publishing. And I say this respectfully, uh, self-publishing, you run down to FedEx Kinko's, you publish your book, you staple some shit together. There you go. There's traditional publishing, like we just talked about. They own your ass and they own the rights to your book and, and so on and so forth. And then for us, we've carved out our lane of what we call professional publishing, where you can put our books on any Barnes & Noble shelf, any airport shelf, and you don't know if it's been uh, produced and published by Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, Penguin, or by Scribe and Lioncrest. So, um, you know, we've carved our lane to, to what's been known as, as professional publishing. We do everything in between the audiobook, the hardcover, the ebook, paperback. Uh, so yeah, start to finish. I love this. And it gives us opportunity to take a little bit of liberties that you might not be able to take with a traditional publisher. Tell me a little bit about David Goggins' audiobook, because I, too, love listening to audiobooks, um, and he did something really cool with it. To tell the audience about what you guys did with David. Yeah. And, you know, so two things on that. You, you mentioned traditional. Traditional as well. You know, they're only interested if you've got you know, 2 million Instagram followers to, mm. you know, because their, their whole arena is book sales. So if they don't feel that you have a following, you're, you're not going to get a deal. So David Goggins, uh, from what we know, that was the first audio book that was ever done that way. So the narrator read the chapter and that at the end, there's a and a with David and, and the narrator. That's the first time an audio book has been done that way. And, and needless to say, Ben, Everybody wants to do their audio book now that way. So mm -hmm. it's, um, but yeah, it, it was, it was a hit. People loved it. Um, <clears throat> hell, I'll give you some, some more insight. That book has been out three and a half years now. This past January, that audio book still sold 60,000 copies. That's how popular that, that book wow. is. Impressive. So yeah. did, did you, did you choose scribe or did they choose you? Tell me a little bit about what got you in the business oh, as, man. as someone who wasn't maybe an avid reader <laughs> when he was younger. Now you're living it. So 
Um, I was the president of a software company and I was traveling a lot and I decided, okay, wow, if something happened to me, my kids wouldn't know where I come from. And I, I wanted my kids to have a legacy piece. I wanted them to know where, where their father came from, what I went through. Uh, and especially because I don't know where my last name comes from. My, my mother got her last name when she was in the orphanage as a kid. And we don't know where that last name came from. So the book for me was, was I wanted to do the book as a legacy piece. I never wanted the book to be public. Uh, that, that book was being done strictly for my kids. And then little so old me I got over here reading to, it. Little old yeah, me reading it, it. Man, I got introduced to the two co-founders of Scribe, wow. uh, Tucker and Zach. Yeah. And the company at the time was like 13 months old. And I started going through the process. And Tucker said, hey, as you're going through the process, will you give me feedback? I said, yeah, you know, no, no problem. Uh, and again, I was president of a software company and you can't write code. Um, but, but so uh, Tucker says, okay, give me feedback. So I'm giving him feedback as I'm going through the process. And, and one thing leads to another. He, myself and Zach uh, go to Starbucks one day and they said, hey, if we give you a ton of equity, would you become the CEO uh, of the company? And I thought to myself, wow, I'm the president of a software company. I can't write code. Now I can be the CEO <laughs> of a publishing company and I can't spell. I, and I thought, well, shit, God bless America. Sign me up. I'm in. So here, yes, here I am. And, and here's what's crazy, Ben. Um, that was six years ago when I became the CEO. Now I'm the largest equity holder of the company. So it's, okay. uh, it, it's crazy to see. Uh, what we've done in, in six years, we've worked with over 2000 authors. Um, yeah, it's, it's been amazing. So Javon's story is unique, but the Javon today is the CEO. What is so unique and why do you believe you're so successful? Like the, the actual question is why did they choose you? They could have chose anyone in the world to, to partner with on this project, but they chose Javon McCormick. Well, why did they choose you? Um, I believe it was from what they had seen a, a piece of my body of work with the software company. But, but I, I also know this for a fact, we were sitting at a table and, and Tucker said to me, man, you've built a great company here, it, re referring to the software company. Yeah. And I, I stopped and I said to him, I go, no, man, no one person builds a great company. It takes a team of people. And and that intrigued him was the the fact that you know you 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 see this now in business. In my opinion: CEOs are over celebrated. I mean, we're, we're, CEOs get so much credit for shit. And and don't get me wrong. As a CEO, I'll be the first to say yes. We make some very hard decisions. Yes, we cast a vision. Yes, we help with the plan. But at the end of the day. It's all of the people that I get to serve and support that execute on that plan. A, a, a plan without execution is, is garbage. It's shit. doesn't matter. You know, and so um, I'm only as good as the great people I get to serve and support. And I personally believe that's a major difference with many of the people in leadership now is that they think a little too highly of themselves if you're in leadership, your role is to serve and support the people who are executing on the mission. That's it. Serve and support. I love it. It's serving leadership. And you talk about it in the book, you know, saying, thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Greeting people, treating them as humans, not treating them as revenue drivers or employees or methods to reach profit. Talk a little bit about treating humans as humans. And it can't be an employee or a partner or a friend or even just the cashier in the grocery line. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, your philosophy on that. You know, it, it's, it's um, so, so one, we have a culture of welcome. And, and, and what I mean by that is it doesn't matter who you voted for. It doesn't matter what pronouns you use. It doesn't matter if you're gay, transgender, if you're Catholic, if you're Jehovah Witness, if you're Jewish, it, it doesn't matter. Welcome. Are you human? And, and where a, a lot of that comes for me is growing up, I, I knew what it was like to not be welcome, to not be accepted because I was mixed race. And, and I, as I got older, 
And in a position of leadership to, to serve and support, I'll be damned if I'm going to be a part of a culture that doesn't welcome everyone. So um, it doesn't matter what pronouns you use. You know, this is a culture of welcome. Uh, if you're transgender, you're damn right. You deserve to be able to use the restroom in peace and not have to worry. Oh, my God, am I going to get beat up because I'm going to to the restroom? It's it's ridiculous. Um, I was always asked as a kid. Hell, I'm still asked this question. People will look at me and they'll say, what are you? And I find the question to be offensive. I'm, I'm, I, excuse my language, ben, but I'm fucking human. Hey, what do you mean? What am I? <laughs> I'm, I'm human. And what they're asking is, yeah. what's your nationality? Okay, okay, well, then ask that question. What's your nationality? Okay, I'm half white, half black. But when people say, what are you? I'm human. And that's part of, in my opinion, part of the problem with our society now is that we're trying to stick everybody in a category. Look, we're human, period. Welcome. Welcome. That's it. Not, I don't want to be accepted. Kiss my ass. I, I don't need you to accept me. I just need you to welcome me. And that's the culture we have, a culture of welcome. And you find that when you welcome others, they're more opted to welcome you as well. So you, you lead with welcome, right? You lead with that acceptance and that empathy, correct? Correct. Well, e even this, when I first joined Scribe, like I said, they were 13 months old, our number one value used to be results. Okay. And I and I changed it to people. And it, it, people first. Every Always lead with people first. And I get so much pushback on this from, from people. And, and, and I will be a, a bit of an ass when I say this. People who push back on me on this one, I, in my opinion, you're just an idiot. It's people process profits. And I've had so many people say to me, well, no, uh, you have to build a great process first before great people. And I said, OK, well, who's going to build the great process? People. So you got to start <laughs> with people. People, great people will build great process, which in, enables you to make great profits. And then you do great things for the communities that you live and work in, period. People process profits. And with those profits, you do great. You do right by people and you do great things for the communities that you live and work in. And then the roads, the, the results come. The results and come. And the results come. If, if you if you hire great people, you can accomplish anything. You just have to hire great people. And if people are, are great for your culture, okay, great. You coach them up or you coach them out, period. And, you know, to your, to your point about some of the things with our culture, just like that, we don't train people. You train a horse, you train your dog, you train your body at the gym. We teach, coach, and mentor people. You, you want to be trained, go, go somewhere else because that's not happening here. You want a job, go there. You want a career, come here. Mm. Who are some of those people that taught, coached, and mentored you throughout the years? Wow, man. Maybe um, someone that I don't learn about in the book because everyone is going, show notes, guys, you need to read this book. I'm not even <laughs> kidding when I say you might laugh, but you'll definitely cry no matter what, you're going to be inspired. So read the book. So let's talk about a mentor or a life experience that isn't in that book that has played a, a drastic role in your life. Man, that's not in the book. That's a tough one because uh, I, I really, I put everyone in there that was, uh, I, I'll give you one. So so my, my co-founder here at Scribe, Tucker Max. Yeah. Tucker said something to me that no one, I, I was probably 45 years old when he said this to me. And no one had ever said this to me before. And, and it was truly life-changing. Tucker and I were sitting in a conference room one time and Tucker said to me, he goes, man, you're the fastest learner I've ever met. And, and I paused, I go, what? I go, did you just say I was one of the fastest learners you've ever met? And he goes, no, I said, you are the fastest learner I've ever met, man. Then no, no one had ever told me I was a, a, a fast learner. You know, I, I graduated high school reading on a fifth and sixth grade level. I got a GED. No one had ever said I was a fast learner. And that was a game changer for me because although I always believed in myself, I've always had confidence uh, at, at times. Shit, I didn't have food, but I had confidence. Uh, but it, 
no one had ever said I was a fast learner. And that really was something that accelerated me that it, it drove me to even want to consume more so I could learn more because now someone had recognized I was a fast learner. That that was so powerful. Yeah, uh, it went hand in hand with how I, how I am with my children. Anyway, I always tell my children I'm proud of them. I always tell them that they're they're uh, great uh, to to believe in themselves, love themselves first, uh, because those were things that no one said to me. You know, no one said that they were proud. And and even then, like I said, when, when Tucker there, I was 45 years old. Someone telling me I was the fastest learner they'd ever met. Uh, Life changing. So there, there's a there's one that didn't make the book. Yeah, going back to the hindsight, it seems like I could see that that is a prophecy that you were a faster learner than you thought because I was reading about your first ever job and you're scrubbing toilets, right? And I want you to tell the story, but you were the best at that job that anyone could ever ask for. Is that not fast learning? Is that not grit? T- tell us the story about your first ever uh, real job in that regard. So my, my yeah, my, my, my first job was was cleaning toilets. And I remember uh, I, I came in every day at nine. Uh, my, my hours were from nine to three at a restaurant. It was called Po Folks. And I would come in from, you know, the, the, the restrooms in the evening were filthy from the night before. So I'd go in and I'd have to clean the toilets. And I remember I looked at the, the toilet one time and I said to myself, okay, if this is my job, I am going to have the cleanest toilets in all of San Antonio, Texas, all of Texas. Uh, I'm going to have the cleanest toilets, period. And where that came from, my dad had said to us as kids one time, He said, no matter what you do in life, be the best at it. He said, if you're going to sweep the streets for a living, be the best street sweeper. And and I always joke, I could have given us something a little more to aspire to than a street sweeper, but uh, I I got the point. And and from there, everything that I did, I wanted to be the the best at. So I would put everything I had into whatever I I was doing uh, so I could be the very best. Very, very best. And you obviously are one of the best. To my knowledge, you've been nominated with all sorts of accolades and awards to this date. Tell me a little bit, uh, Austin, Entrepreneur of the Year. Don't quote me. You tell me some of the accolades <laughs> that, that are up and coming. Congratulations. Oh, accolades. man. I appreciate it, Ben. I've got um, someone pointed this out to me the other day. So, so scribe. Yeah. We have been named the number one company culture in America by Entrepreneur Magazine. Wow. We have been named the number one best place to work in Austin, the number two best place to work in Texas. And I think it was last November, October, November, I was voted for and named uh, the best CEO in, in Austin, which was a hell of an honor considering the the uh, all of the tech and everything that's here in booming, Austin. Too. Booming, beautiful city, yeah. yes. So that was big. And then uh, recently uh, I was nominated by EY, Ernst & Young, uh, for Entrepreneur of the Year. So we'll wait to see how that plays out. But I, I was nominated and we'll, we'll see what happens. So um, incredibly uh, proud, flattered. Um, but again, I, I will say this time and time again, I said this from stage when I won, uh, best CEO in, in, in Austin, I said this on stage, accepting the award. I found it a little comical that I was re- receiving this award, uh, award because I don't do the work, you know, it, it's it, the, the, the team executes. Yes. And, and so I, I am only as good as the great people I get to serve and support. That is my role, serve and support. Again, I make some decisions. I help with the vision. I help with the plan. But all of the people, the 100 plus people in in the company, uh, they execute every day to to make the the company what it is. My my role is to serve and support those, those individuals. Yeah, you and your team are winning these awards together, but you are the leader, Javon. And and I'm wondering when you're building that team and that company culture, are there certain things you were, uh, you look for from your teammates, from the people you hire, mentor, and train? Because obviously one of the things you're doing so well is not just what you do. It's what you and your leadership team does to mentor the entire 
the entire team, the entire staff. Are, are there any essentials that Scribe lives by? Yeah, the the, the culture it, itself is what we live by. So our culture doc, our culture Bible is um, uh, public facing. You can go and read our, our, our values and, and anyone can see it. And I'm, in, that's I'm making very, a note that'll go in the show notes. I'm reading. There you that. go, man. Uh, it, it's very intentional because here, here's what's interesting. You go to work for most companies. You don't know what they stand for until your first week there when you're doing onboarding or whatever, and they walk sure. you around the office and you see a couple of bullshit posters on the wall or whatever, <laughs> um, and, and see. But but right. we intentionally make our culture bible public facing because we want you to know what we stand for and who we are before you get here. Because you may read it and say, mm, "I'm not. I, I don't. I don't agree with it." Great. It, it, it doesn't work for you. Doesn't work for us. So don't. It, it you save us time, we'll save you time. Right. Um, but there are many people who read it and they want to be a part of that. And so it's just a completely different way. You mentioned something a, a moment ago. You said me and my team. Um, yes. I refuse to use the word my or I mm-hmm. unless I'm taking responsibility for a mistake that was made. It's it's our team. No one works for me. People work with me. I'm no one's boss. Um, if in, in fact, here's another piece you ask about the culture. If you are in leadership at Scribe Media, your role is a direct support. So you hear in most companies, who's your direct report? Who, you know, what, who are your direct reports? Mm-mm. If you are in leadership at Scribe Media, your role is to serve and support. So you'll ask someone, who's your direct support? support. Who directly supports you? So we've just flipped so much of what we do in a different direction that makes it truly people focused. Um, you know, we've, we've got an emergency fund. What I mean by that is growing up again, poor, like my mom. Uh, I read an article recently, about a year ago, that said 45% of Americans don't have a spare $400 cash in case of an, an emergency came up. And that was my mom. My mom didn't have uh, a spare $400. Right. And I thought, man, this is that's, that's such bullshit. So uh, we put in place what we call uh, an emergency fund. If someone has an emergency, no questions asked, they can uh, borrow $1,500 interest-free, and then they make the payments back o- over time. Mm-hmm. But it's something to where it eases the pressure of day-to-day life. Like if you get a flat tire or something happens, you know, yeah. oh my gosh, you know, the, the company's got me. You know, I, we've got the emergency fund. We pay 100% of our, our tri- of all the tribe members of their benefits, uh, healthcare and medical. Um, it just, the, the whole way we do business is very people focused. The people that we work with, that we serve and support, the authors that we work with, that we serve and support. So yeah, it's it's just a, a different, truly people first culture. I love the culture. The three big takeaways for me, Javon, are words matter just in the way yes. you're framing your conversations here. The people matter. And the culture around the people matters just as important as anything. You know, it's funny, Ben, you said, yeah. I, I'm so happy you picked up on that. Uh, words matter. So when I was a kid, yes. I remember people saying, uh, and, and I know you remember this phrase, um, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And, and I would tell people, kiss my ass. <laughs> when, when, you're getting, when, when you're getting called zebra and Oreo cookie and, and half breed, words hurt. And, and so I'm very, God knows my vocabulary is very limited, but, but I'm very intentional with the words that I use. E- even this, um, we do not use the word satisfaction. You know, you, 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 I, I cannot understand this. You'll hear so many companies say customer satisfaction is our number one priority. And, and I think to myself, that exact just, voice too. Just, that yeah, exact exactly. Voice. <laughs> but think about this. Yes. <clears throat> Who wants to be satisfied? If my wife goes to girls night out on Friday and someone says to my wife, hey, how's your husband? If my wife says, I oh, satisfactory, I'm going to be a little pissed. OK, if, if someone <laughs> says if, if my he's about to see. Yeah, he's satisfactory. He'll, he'll do, um, you know, or, or my kids, you know, oh, my dad's satisfactory. No. no. I, so we are looking to fulfill. 
We want people to have a fulfilled life, an enjoyable life. We want our authors to be fulfilled with the experience they're going through, a phenomenal author experience. What the hell? Customer satisfaction, that's the bar. It, it just so I'm very intentional with words. Mm. On that topic of words, it's reminding me of how, so your book is, and you've told this story before, but if anyone hasn't listened to it, I think it's tremendously important. And I'd love to hear you tell it. So when you published the book, you were JT and yeah. you lived a lot of your adult career as JT. Tell me about why you chose to go by JT and why you dropped the JT and went with Javon. Oh man. So, um, early in, in my career, when I was trying to get on people's calendars and, and trying to get appointments, could not could not land appointments and, and, and for, for anything. One white guy, nice guy. I, I mean, I, I so would like to still know this gentleman's name, <laughs> but he, he he picks up the phone. And, you know, this is back before, you know, email. I'm, I'm 50, so this is early 90s. And uh, he picks up the phone and he says, um, hey, how'd you get a black first name? in an Irish last name, because my name's Javon McCormick. Well, what was crazy is I didn't know my last name was Irish. So I was just elated. Like, oh shit, my last name's Irish. This is amazing. Because yeah. again, my mom got our last name in the children, in the uh, orphanage, in the children's home. So I hang up the call with him and it hits me. Oh, they're seeing my name, Javon. And that's why I'm not getting any calls or returns or getting any appointments. So my full name is Javon Thomas McCormick. So I immediately start going by JT. I'm like, that's it. I'm gonna go by JT McCormick. Man, the next week, Ben, calendar blew up. Got appointments, got calls, got it. And so from my early 20s to, what was it? Uh, June of 2020, two years ago, um, yeah. I would go by JT. And then I, you know, the, the George Floyd murder happened. Mm -hmm. And the the virtue signaling that was going on was, was just absolutely garbage. You know, we we had people do Blackout Tuesday on social media. What the hell does that do to help anybody? Blackout Tuesday, or or we were arguing over a syrup bottle, a damn syrup bottle. What the hell is that going to do to help anyone? But what actually jumped out to me was I saw an article that said that there were only three black. Fortune 500 CEOs. I was like, oh, interesting. So I went and looked at their names. Marvin Ellison, Kenneth Frazier, and Roger Ferguson. And as a bonus, the wealthiest black man in America is named Robert Smith. So I, I looked and I go, oh, three very ethnic free names, if you will. Yeah, Bob Smith. A exactly. Yeah. So I, I said to myself, okay. I'm not a Fortune 500 CEO, but I've I've made it to the CEO chair and we, we've won a few awards and we've, we've done a few things. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to reclaim my name and I'm going to start going by Javon. Because what I had to admit and acknowledge was I was part of the problem. I edited myself to fit in to corporate America. And the reason why I reclaim my name is I wanted every Ravante, Martavius, Laquanda, Lucretia to be able to see a Javon in the CEO chair. To to and, and I did it with the belief that maybe one day you could work with Javon and not just JT. And, and again, I was part of the problem. The fact that I edited myself, the fact that I became JT to fit into the corporate America playbook, that in itself is a problem because the playbook has to be erased and broken somewhere. So for me, it was, okay, I'm going to go by Javon McCormick. I don't want to be a part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution. And I want others who have quote unquote ethnic names to be able to see that, uh, that a Javon sits in the, the CEO chair. Yes, sir. Javon. Thank you for being vulnerable enough to share that and do that. And I want to be part of the solution with you. Um, wow. You're, you're probably going to make the top three someday. And it, you aren't <laughs> going to make it. Your entire team, we are going to make it. There um, it is, man. Yes, sir. Um, to wrap up, I want to go rapid fire. 
These are short, okay. sweet, either or, fill in the blank, cross the answer out, just say whatever the heck you want kind of questions, just to get to know Javon, the man, a little bit better. Let's do it. Coffee or tea? Oh, coffee. Favorite furry animal? Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, I'd have to go with a big dog of some sort. I don't, I'm not a, I'm not a, and I'm, I'm sorry, whoever I may have been, I'm not a little dog guy. I like, I like big dogs. So, so a big furry dog, big old furry dog. Yeah. Are you, are you a morning person? Are you a night owl? Oh man, morning, uh, three 4 AM. Let's, let's, let's go. So obviously you're very committed to your team. You're very committed to your work and your family. <sighs> What does Javon love? Like outside of family, work, reading, education, learning, what lights you up that someone might not know about you? Man, um, I, I appreciate that question. Is so so what I have done with my life is put it into what I call five pillars. So God, health, family, business, and investing. If it doesn't fall within those five pillars, I don't do it. You know, um, I, I love to watch football, but, you know, Tom Brady didn't send me any of his, his $20 million check. So I didn't watch the Super Bowl that year. So it, it's um, I, I love golf. Golf takes about four and a half hours to play a round of golf. My two oldest, my eight year old and my six year old are now in golf lessons. So we can start going out onto the golf course. But truly, I love golf business. I'm a student of business. I, I love reading about the, the John D. Rockefellers, the uh, uh, George Westinghouse, mm. uh, Bob Iger, Tim Cook, uh, just business. What makes it go round? Why are certain decisions made? Why, why did they go that? Why did they go left instead of right? Uh, the economy as a whole right now, the things that we're going through, why did we leave interest rates so low for so long? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm truly a student of business and I, I've been blessed to find my lane in life, which is, is business and investing. Um, the, you, you know this from the book, the great majority of my money has been made in the stock market. It wasn't actually made in, you know, at the software company or here at the publishing company. It was made in the stock market. Um, I self-taught my, myself to, to invest in stocks. So, yeah, that's... I know that was a, a wasn't rapid fire, oh, but there's yeah, the I answer. Love <laughs> I love it, and we'll do one more not yeah. so rapid fire. I almost want to slow down and think about this one, but billboard side of the road, millions, if not billions, of people are going to see it um, from all ethnicities and all religious backgrounds and all financial backgrounds. Billboard side of the world to to a method for the simple person that anyone from any culture can understand and learn from. I know it's not easy to come to a billboard little piffy phrase, but from everything you've learned and, and everything you've been through and everything you've learned about culture and leadership and serving leadership, does anything come to mind of the perfect words to put on that billboard? You know, it, it, it's, it, you can go deeper into the, the, the word itself, but if it was me, the billboard would be, Black with white letters, because I'm half white, half black. Um, and the word would be welcome, period. Because if you truly dive into the word welcome, then you got to welcome everyone. Mm. Um, I'm a God guy. My kids go to private Christian school. Yes. Um, and some people are, are really taken back by this. So I'm a God guy. I'm a Christian guy. Um, our chief experience officer she does not believe in God and she's gay and people are floored when I tell them, I said, yeah. And if God forbid she got in a car accident, I would be the first person there to pick her up, give her a bath, wipe her ass, uh, read her story, albeit a slow story. Um, and, and people are thrown by that. And they're like, well, how can you, because it's welcome. And, and I, I remind people of this all the time. And, and this really, they look at me and they're, they're stunned. If anyone's taken the time or even heard the story of Jesus and the prostitute, well, I want you to think for a second, where do I come from? My mom was a prostitute. Everybody I welcome because that story is very meaningful to me. Jesus didn't judge. Jesus welcomed everyone, even the prostitute. So my billboard would say welcome, because if you truly live by welcome, 
You can't be judgmental. My mom used to always say to me, never judge anyone because everyone has a story and you don't know their story. So if you truly live by the word welcome, you have to be non-judgmental. You have to welcome everyone. Uh, the Bible says, love thy neighbor. Doesn't say you get to pick your neighbor. It says, love thy neighbor, period. Doesn't say love thy neighbor, but not if they're mixed right. race. Right. Love thy neighbor, but not if they're gay. Love thy neighbor, but not if they're transgender. No, it says, love thy neighbor. So my billboard would say, welcome. Welcome. I got goosebumps. I'm filled with gratitude. Thank you for taking the time with us today. Um, tremendously grateful. I want to acknowledge and, and and basically set an intention, everyone listening, that we just started the conversation. It's not over. There's a lot more to do. There's a lot more to learn. How should people be welcomed more into your world and, and ultimately keep in touch with Scribe Media, you personally? What should be my next action step to learn more? Oh, man. So Scribe Media, that one's easy. You can go to scribemedia.com. We've got every video known to man on there, every question you could possibly have about publishing your book, uh, everything, you, every FAQ, it's there on the site. Success stories, how people have utilized their books. Uh, if you're looking for me personally, uh, LinkedIn, and, and I got to share this with you, Ben, our, our team, uh, they started a TikTok uh, account okay. for me. So they put videos of me up on TikTok going off on rants about whatever topic they, they throw at me. And I have been blown away. I think I got like 38,000 followers now and yes. it's only been up for like two months. Um, so yeah, TikTok, I will just you know give my opinion of, of what, what I think. But yeah, TikTok and LinkedIn are probably the best places to, to find me. And I'll put it in the show notes. And I, I love that because TikTok is a younger platform, but it's young yeah. and old. A lot of people need to hear this. Um, and so I'm blessed that you came on this show to tell that story. And you're, I'll go follow you on TikTok, LinkedIn. I know you're very active there. Man, you've been a pleasure. I appreciate it, Javon. I, I hope we can do it again. And, and thank you one more time. Uh, Big Ben, man, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, sir. Thanks again for listening to Learn, Speak, Teach, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. You need to go subscribe if you haven't yet. This show is completely free. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend and explain your favorite part. Leave us a review on Apple, Google Podcasts, or anywhere you listen to the show. All right. Thanks once more for listening to LST. I am so grateful. Talk to you soon.